Got some earnings this week. Uh, Apple, I think Amazon, the biggies. Is that uh, what you mean by be careful? Well, look, Apple is trading at 33 times earnings. It was at about 16 times earnings for most of its big rise up throughout the 2010 decade. So it's far above its own historical multiple. You could argue some of that's justified. Maybe they really can create another iPhone like uh, consumer innovation. But I'd be skeptical that you can follow up on the success of the most successful consumer product in history. I, I think it's expensive. Phenomenal company, unbelievable earnings power, but you just have to really pay up to own it. I think people go, well, I'd be happy to pay 33 times for a company that's going to compound in value the way that Apple does. So tell me the names you're looking at and whether you think they can generate you know, as exciting returns as some of the tech giants seem to be able to do these days. Well, again, I think you have to look at uh, the full market cycle, not the last six months. You had Amazon down last year 60 percent. You had Facebook down 70. So there's a huge volatility investors have to buy and do. And if you look at the NASDAQ, for 23 years, it's compounded at 3 percent per year. So you're exactly right. You get huge booms that have happened, like, in the last six months. But unless people are timing their entry and exit perfectly— which, forgive me for being skeptical of their ability to do so, I actually think that the returns are quite subpar when one is overpaying for stocks. And so what we like to do is sort of eliminate some of that risk as much as possible by just focusing on cash flows, and particularly cash flows that come back to us in the form of rising dividends. And is it true that financials are an area that screens really well for you? I mean, financials are coming off their best month since 2016. Yeah, it was a great month in that regard, although it's funny, we get exposure to financials in a little different way than a lot of people think of, because we're so used to thinking of financials as the banks. Right. And even though we do own J.P. Morgan, which has had a great year and is actually a beneficiary of some of the problems in the regional banks, um, the asset managers are really where we have bigger exposure, particularly alternative asset managers. Blackstone, Apollo, uh, Al Rock are, are all in our portfolio. We think there's a huge theme on private credit, but we like fee-based businesses that are not taking all the risk on their balance sheet. So they have huge earnings power without a lot of the volatility that some of the big investment banks have. Yeah, fair enough. And we've, you know, I've heard others, Charlie Babrinskoy, for instance, an, uh, a fan of kind of investing in the financials that way. Uh, maybe instead of having to cherry pick the regional banks that you th think might make it through okay right now. What about uh, energy, where I was reading some stats earlier from our Nick Wells? All of a sudden, you're seeing some overbought action in some of the main energy ETFs here. Well, I think that there's an interesting thing with this term base effect that comes up a lot when we describe inflation. You know, a number can look good or bad based on where things were a year ago. And they're talking about earnings growth is down in energy because uh, compared to a year ago, it was just up huge, obviously, from the priors. So you're kind of trading base effects there. That's just not how we look at it. Both in midstream and upstream, we just view drastically improved financial metrics, lower debt ratios, lower leverage with far greater earnings power. And really, the commodities have not been a big tailwind. They right. haven't hurt. But oil prices have stayed somewhere between the high 60s and the high 70s all year. And it's, so it's not a commodity story. You have great earnings power. We particularly love midstream because we're just underbuilt mm -hmm. for that infrastructure, for pipelines, for LNG export terminals. And we love the ability to get these cash flows that grow year over year. And I mean double-digit growth in, in dividend. And I didn't realize, because I was off last week, but WTI is back above 81. So that's quite a move it's been making, really, in the past just 7 to 10, 10 days. We're about to talk real estate. Before we do, I want to hit your play on this, which is a little unexpected. Uh, it's the mole giant, if I can call it that, Simon Property Group. And maybe we can show a 10-year chart. Why do you like this, and, and why do you think this is going to generate, you know, better than um, decent returns? Yeah, I'm, I'm such a homer for Simon Property that I uh, always wince when we call it a mall giant because it's a high-end mall giant. So it's not that kind of decrepit mall in a, in a smaller town that's really hurting like a strip mall, right? They own great assets, great real estate. In some cases, they'll end up repurposing. They're doing condos and hotels and entertainment plazas. They just own such great brick-and-mortar and dirt. 
and they bought J.C. Penney basically for free to go repurpose some of these things so they can sell them to Amazon for warehouses. I mean, there's really a lot of optionality in Simon Property, and even apart from that optionality, the net operating income is huge. But Their vacancies me... are extremely low. Mm -hmm. So we really like the story of Simon Property. We're patient investors around a really high yield there, about 7 percent. So that might exactly explain, if we can put up that 10-year chart again, the shares are basically flat during that period, technically down 17 percent. But to you, this is really more, you know, compact. If you're getting 7% a year on top of that, then suddenly you stack that up and that looks, you know, a lot more healthy.